Father Peter Sabbath, the pastor here at St. Thomas of Beckett Parish in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I've been here for three years and I've been ordained a priest 20 years, since 1998. I was born here in Montreal to a non-practicing Jewish family. Both my parents were also born here. I had one sister who's a bit older than, than I. And uh, I grew up in a mostly secular home. In uh, Montreal, if you're not Catholic, you generally go to the Protestant school. So we went to the Protestant school. So I knew a lot of Protestants. There were a lot of other Jews there as well. And we said each day the Our Father. We began each day that way. God save the Queen. And uh, we learned the Bible stories. Yet at home, we did not really practice our faith too much. We maybe a few times on the special holy days, we go to synagogue, uh, have a Passover meal at, the, at home or with family. But it was not, our faith did not really touch our lives or our home a lot. It was a bit compartmentalized. As I grew older, I developed in my late teens really a desire to start to understand why I was here on earth, what was the meaning of my life. And it was, uh, it was the 1960s when a lot of people were asking those questions. In fact, I dropped out of university just before graduation, traveled around uh, to different parts of the country, different, uh, different experiences, different relationships, and finally visited a Catholic retreat house where I spent uh, some years. And uh, it was through a visit to St. Joseph's Oratory with a Catholic friend at a mass that I received the gift of my faith. And uh, it was quite interesting. I was baptized a couple of years later and at the day of the baptism, after all the excitement, I had a, an awareness that something had come to completion that had started when I was a child and I knew exactly what it was, even though I hadn't thought of it all my life, was uh, having uh, seen a movie called The Robe when I was six or eight years old. It was a very popular book and movie of that time, and it concerned the garment of Christ while he was on the cross that was he was stripped of, and that was through uh, gambled by the soldiers which one would get that seamless garment. And this tells the supposed story of the one who receives the garment, how he carry walking around with uh, Christ's garment in his uh, backpack, how he receives the gift of faith and eventually is, is martyred. I knew I'd seen it, I hadn't thought about it, but somehow a seed was planted in my soul that came to fruition that day, you know, 20 years later when I was uh, baptized. I continued to work at the retreat house, and at a certain point when the house closed, I decided to go to Rome for a sabbatical. And while I was there, uh, studying spirituality, I realized that I had a, a desire to know my faith more deeply on, uh, on an intellectual level. It was beautiful being in Rome, seeing people come from all over the world for a common purpose, and also the, uh, the, the history of the church being present there from St. Peter from the very first days. And I, I can see this congruence of, of these two factors that made, makes it unique in the world. I loved the studies that I was doing there at the Angelicum University run by the Dominican Fathers. I studied philosophy, I studied theology, and uh, when it came time to do uh, my master's, or licentiate as it's called, uh, I decided to explore the uh, Eucharist, the real presence, because at my conversion, that was what, how, how God gave me the gift of faith at the Mass when the priest consecrated the host and held up the consecrated host, I knew that the, was the body of Christ. I didn't understand it, it was a great mystery, so I decided to go into that uh, more deeply. I eventually returned to Montreal and uh, entered the seminary here in Montreal. And because I already had the licentiate, the bishop asked me to complete a doctorate. And I decided uh, also to focus my studies on uh, the Eucharist, the worship of the Eucharist outside of Mass, adoration. A little bit the history, the theology, the spirituality, the liturgical uh, elements. And it was, a, it was a beautiful experience to study more deeply all those aspects of the Eucharist, which has always been the heart of my life, my spirituality, and my prayer life too. 
So while I was at the seminary, I had my uh, human and pastoral formation there, also spending time in the local parish on weekends and eventually doing an internship full time. I was ordained by Cardinal Jean-Claude Turcotte at St. Patrick's Basilica uh, on May 29th, 1998 and celebrated my first Mass at St. Joseph's Oratory on uh, June uh, 30th, 1998. And that was a great joy for me to celebrate my first Mass in the place where I, at the same altar where I had uh, received the faith 16 years previously. to consider becoming a Catholic? I didn't really think of it in that way, that I was moving towards that, but uh, I was really in, uh, I would say, in meditation, in my dreams, I was really making contact, or kind of Christ was making contact with, with me, with a lot of resistance, because that was, on my conscious level, it was not something I wanted at all. Okay. And then I went with this friend to uh, a Mass at St. Joseph's Oratory, one evening and during the Mass, uh, I received the gift of faith and, and everything changed. And I said, I'm a Christian. And that was it. Wow, so it was quite sudden. It, yes, it, 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 was, was, a, it was a long journey to something sudden. That's right, it was a process <laughs> of, of uh, t two years, I would say, uh, at that retreat house that culminated in this moment that I can, a time and a place and a date and that I can pinpoint. And was there something about the, the Mass itself that was, was drawing you? It was when the priest held up the, the host at the consecration, this is my body. And uh, at that moment it felt like my, my, my head and my heart joined in a way, you know, that we, we live with those uh, separated often and it felt like uh, I, I became an integrated in a certain way. And I just knew this was not bread, this was Christ. And the words kept going in my mind, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Mm. And uh, there were ups and downs after that, but that faith uh, remained. So you had a sense of the real presence and that there was a sense of completion in you. Absolutely. And, and uh, I went outside after on the kind of uh, plaza uh, yeah. overlooking St. Joseph's, uh, from St. Joseph's Oratory. And uh, although it hadn't rained, the, the world had that sense of after rain, when everything is fresh and clean and, and new, mm. uh, that's what the world looked like for me. And that's really what I felt inside. I think looking back, you know, maybe you would say it was a, a kind of a baptism in the spirit. Yes. That I was renewed interiorly and the world was renewed exteriorly. It was, uh, it was a rebirth for sure. What a beautiful grace. Yeah. Yeah. And so what do you do after a wonderful grace like that? You said there's lots of ups and downs after that. Well, I had come from a very secular background and I had lived through the, the 60s and uh, my, my consciousness, my mind was still not, hadn't reached there. I was kind of, uh, there was still a, a, a chasm. So it took me quite a while for my, my mind, my worldview to catch up to that. Yes. But it was, um, I wouldn't in any way compare it to uh, St. Paul being uh, thrown, thrown to the ground, but there was that sense of uh, everything, a radical shifting in my life. I needed for the, the next few years, I, I spent a lot of time uh, by myself in silence and in prayer uh, because I, I trying to absorb and assimilate and integrate what had happened to me. It was that intense in a way. Yes. The, the, the moment of the conversion was, was rather gentle. There, there were no fireworks, but something uh, uh, powerful had happened and it, it really uh, required a, a, a real change in my outlook, my view of uh, life, of the world, of, uh, of so many things, mm -hmm. because I was uh, really formed in a very uh, secular, materialistic worldview. Yes. So after that before and after moment, there was still an element that 
of seeking in your spiritual journey? I, I wouldn't necessarily use that word. I remember a few years later when I went away to, uh, to study and uh, someone said, oh, that's wonderful, you're still searching. And I said, well, my search ended when I met Christ. I was no longer seeking. What, what continued was a desire to deepen my faith, to understand more of it, but I was, uh, the search, ah. the, the search had ended. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really to, uh, to catch up to that, that moment, uh, that, that moment of grace that had been given me and to know how to live it, to express it and what to do with it in my life. And so there was a growing in understanding, a growing in relationship as well. And, and how did you, uh, pursue that? Well, it even took me a couple of years to decide to be baptized. I was living in this Catholic retreat house and I wasn't ready for that, that step. Uh, I needed to again to integrate this very powerful experience that had happened to me. And then at a certain point I was making a little retreat at the monastery that I, I went to. I spent a couple of days there and I just said to the monk there, I said, I, yeah, I'm ready to be baptized. Mm. And he said, okay, fine. I said, well, let's go. <laughs> and he said, well, doesn't happen exactly like that. We'll have a little period of uh, preparation. And so we did that and I was uh, baptized at the octave of the Easter Vigil uh, that year. And so it's a long journey from the, the, those sacraments to priesthood. So, yes. so how did you um, come to journey towards priesthood? Well, it was, uh, it was a long journey. Uh, I continued to work in the retreat house for many years, eventually became a, a deacon. And after the retreat house closed, I decided to take a sabbatical in uh, Rome to study uh, spirituality. And then once I was there, the desire really to study more and to know more about my faith was very strong because I had had this interior experience. I had been reading a certain amount and working with a lot of sisters and priests in, in the retreat house but I'd never done any kind of systematic study of the faith yes. uh, or had a real catechal background uh, formation. And that, that became very strong. I realized when I got to Rome and uh, got a taste of it. So I stayed there for a number of years and did a, a few decree degrees. And I guess it was there that the desire to, uh, the question about priesthood came up and uh, people would approach me and say, have you thought of this? When I came back from Rome, uh, the same thing happened. People would say, why don't you become a priest? And finally the bishop said the same thing to me. So I, I said, well, I'll try it. So Father Peter, what sustains you as a priest? Prayer. It's, it's our oxygen. In a world that's so confused and confusing, so many difficulties of every kind, uh, so many demands on us, uh, so many pulls of, of information that's coming to us, so many different uh, kinds of challenges. It's, it's that simple. That's with, without that, without prayer, spiritual reading, uh, regular time uh, away quietly, uh, I would not survive. And do you find that uh, growing up with an influence of Judaism has had an impact on how you are as a priest, how you live your priesthood? Well, it's hard for me to judge that perhaps. Um, I would say that I feel close to some of the Old Testament leaders such as Moses, who was a great uh, leader of his people. Uh, I draw inspiration from how he was a leader. Uh, I feel close to uh, David and his uh, love for God and his uh, praise of God in his humanity and his sinfulness, and yet God was always there and uh, that he, he turned, always turned back to God. So perhaps um, in those ways, I'm not a scholar of Judaism. I know a lot of Catholics who were born Catholic, who know a lot more about the faith than, than I do, but certainly as I grow in my Catholic faith, uh, I feel more strongly connected to my Judaism at the same time. And what have been some of the joys and challenges in your life as a priest? Well, the joy is waking up each day and doing uh, what you feel you were born to do mm -hmm. and uh, being able to help people in the, all the moments of their life, uh, being with them in the joyful moments, being able to uh, 
console them in the difficult moments. Uh, the confessional, of course, is, is a place of great uh, privilege where people open their hearts and you uh, have the chance to, uh, to guide them a little bit. And also just the forgiveness, the absolution that comes in the Sacrament of Reconciliation is, uh, is so powerful. I guess the big challenge now is uh, trying to communicate the faith to people in a more and more secular, post-Christian, post-Judeo-Christian society, yes. uh, where their vocabulary is less and less connecting with our vocabulary and a way to communicate the faith, to evangelize to people who are formed by the media, television, internet, and so on, that is often really uh, opposed, sometimes hostile to uh, the faith. What Bishop Barron talks about, uh, the, uh, the fallacy of scientism, that only what can be measured and weighed and uh, is, is, is real. And we're talking about faith, which is, cannot be measured or weighed, but has a greater reality than those things. Yeah. Uh, and also the challenge of, um, at this time in history where there's so many uh, clergy abuse scandals, for instance, uh, is, is very difficult because people's faith is, is shaken. Our faith is shaken by that because it seems to go on and on and, uh, you know, priests, bishops, cardinals, and uh, it becomes uh, very difficult. We have to recognize the reality. We have to let our people know that this is a reality, but that there's a lot more to the church, that they have to be aware of it, but not immerse themselves in it. I know people that are constantly, constantly going on the internet and reading over and over all these uh, scandals and terrible stories, that has to be balanced with prayer, with reading about the, the saints, with reading uh, the wonderful, wonderful uh, books that are coming out are, are, are already there, the resources we have, uh, Bishop Barron and so many others on, uh, that help to strengthen our faith, because that's those small minority of priests and bishops and so on are not the, uh, the whole reality. Christ promised the church would uh, remain till he, he returns and uh, the gates of hell would not prevail. And uh, we're, we're feeling the, the influence of, uh, of evil for sure. Mm -hmm. What might you say, Father Peter, to somebody who might be considering priesthood but consider celibacy an obstacle to their vocation? Well, I can understand that it's very difficult for a lot of young men to renounce having a, a, a personal uh, intimate relationship, an exclusive relationship with a spouse and renouncing uh, having children uh, can be very difficult. You know, again, every life has certain sacrifices. Uh, we present, I think, a message that it's possible to uh, live uh, without the sexual activity that the culture is saying that you can't survive without that all, all the time and that it is, if, if lived properly, with the correct understanding, the correct spirituality, it becomes transformed into uh, a love for, for everybody, for those you serve. This is, this is your family. You know, every life has its challenges. Many, many married people have, uh, somebody gets sick, they they're living, end up living a kind of a celibate life. They, they experience great loneliness, even in, in, in a married relationship. So, Yes, we, we have our challenges, especially in a hyper-sexualized culture, but it certainly is, uh, is possible and it's a beautiful gift to, uh, to God and to the church. And do you have any advice that you might give to a young man who might be discerning a uh, vocation to the priesthood? Uh, to quote John Paul II, who quote, quoting the scriptures, be not afraid. Uh, that, that's uh, really what it is. To even with the challenges that it brings when you're giving your life for others and when you're, you're, you're doing something that is uh, so rewarding in so many ways, the, what you have to sacrifice is, is small. And in every life there is uh, there's sacrifice, of course. Yes. So I would encourage anyone who's considering a vocation to pray, to talk to, to good priests, to spend time in silence, uh, to immerse themselves in the scripture and the sacraments and uh, be not afraid.
So Father Peter, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and for your wisdom and insight. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a great pleasure. When I was in Rome discerning my vocation to the priesthood, I did two things. I spent time each day in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, and I consulted with various knowledgeable and holy priests that I knew. And I would, uh, so I would advise any young man considering vocation to the priesthood to do the same, prayer and uh, advice from, from others. And so it's uh, my pleasure now to give you uh, God's blessing. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. I'm very happy to introduce Shalom World, a new Catholic family-oriented Catholic TV that will be 24-7 English-speaking television channel. I hope that this, through this media we will be able to continue to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, a world that needs shalom, that needs the peace that comes from the King of Peace, Jesus Christ. I congratulate all those who participate in supporting this new media and that it may continue to reach millions and millions of people all over the world where we need the light of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.